There we go. Okay, everyone, thank you for joining us today. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, hopefully, more people will filter in. But we'll get through the. Uh, there we go. Uh, so, this is uh, the Integrated Design Lab. My name is Dylan Agnes. Uh, we are a research consulting firm dedicated to the education, outreach, and technical support for high performance, uh, energy efficient building design. Uh, this lecture is sponsored by the Idaho Power Program. Uh, a couple of uh, separate programs in addition to this lecture series that they sponsor uh, would be technical design assistance. The IDL can provide varying levels of energy efficiency, uh, technical assistance, and project-based training to professionals uh, within the Idaho Power Service Territory. Uh, it's broken into three phases. Uh, phases are determined based on a uh, scope of work. Uh, anything over $4,000, though, uh, requires a cost share agreement by Idaho Power. Uh, for more details, please visit our website. Uh, another lecture series that is sponsored by Idaho Power is uh, the Building Simulation Users Group, or BSUG. Uh, the next one is April 28th. Uh, it's going to be an update on Revit's Insight uh, by Ian Malloy. Ian Malloy is the project manager um, over at Autodesk for um, for the Revit Insight uh, program. Uh, so we're really lucky to have him uh, speak with us. Uh, we're gonna be sending out a advert newsletter for that uh, this week, so look for that. Uh, another program is the Energy Resource Library. It's a free resource uh, for Idaho Power customers. The library, we have hundreds of free tools and guides to help uh, experts uh, in building officials, building maintenance, or uh, architects or engineers uh, potentially looking at identifying energy efficiency measures. Uh, some of our more popular categories would be thermal cameras, data loggers, flow meters, um, as well as light meters, uh, but we have much more. Uh, to learn more about that, please visit our website. Uh, and now I'm going to turn it over to Sheree Wilhite, who is an Idaho Power representative. Uh, she's going to talk briefly about uh, the next couple slides. Sheree. Hello. So I just wanted to remind you about our energy efficiency programs. I manage our new construction and major renovation portion of the program. Um, we also have a retrofit um, prescriptive portion of the program as well. And then we also have custom projects. So that's for anything kind of outside the box um, where we see electric energy savings. So don't forget about our programs. We also have a flex peak demand response program as well. Um, go ahead and move to the next slide. I believe we have one more slide, Dylan. And then I wanted to let you know, we are rolling out a new construction and major renovation program change on June 1st of this year. So we are making changes to the program. And then I also wanted to remind you that right now we have, for a limited time, we have a doubling of the professional assistance incentive. So that is the incentive that goes to the architect or engineer for helping the owner with the paperwork and requirements of that final application. And that incentive used to be 10% of the, pr of the customer's incentive up to $2,500 per project. But we've currently doubled that, and that is through September 23rd. So that's through any final applications that come in through September 23rd. That doesn't take away from the owner's incentive or the customer's incentive. This is in addition, and it's just to cover for some of your time helping them with the paperwork requirements. Now, I'm hoping to extend that past September 23rd, but I can't guarantee that. So if you have some projects that are done, they're completed, and the application just needs to be turned in and the supporting documentation, try to get those in before September 23rd in case I'm not able to extend that. And then always, um, I'm available as well as Chris Paulo on the custom side, so feel free to reach out to us if you need any help on our programs or have any questions. That's it. Thanks, Dylan. Okay, thank you, Sheree. All right, so uh, let's get into today's lecture. Uh, today we're going to talk about daylighting, uh, specifically getting some of the details right about your projects, so, um, some lessons, uh, avoiding missteps, and we'll go into detail uh, on the facade uh, about refining the windows, light shelves. And if we have extra time, I will definitely tell you about skylights. Uh, so daylighting uh, is to allow sunlight into buildings or a space for the intended purpose of being controlled to illuminate the building increase occupant satisfaction or productivity, and to save energy. Uh, that's kind of how daylighting designers like to define it. 
Uh, code likes to see it in more of a the practice of placing windows, other openings such as skylights or solar tubes, and reflective services so that sunlight can provide effective internal lighting. Uh, daylighting gets into the renewable energy category. Uh, however, it is limited in its availability, i.e. the supply is not always available to meet demand. Uh, and when you talk about daylighting as a renewable uh, energy, what you're really talking about is daylight harvesting. Uh, so daylighting, uh, three most common, um, in addition to you know side lighting, having windows on the perimeter, uh, would be skylights, clear stories, uh, and solar tubes. Uh, on the right are images of additional uh, methods for um, daylighting strategy. Uh, however, most of those um, are actually what I would consider multipliers, um, such as a light shelf or reflective blind. Um, they're more of a control strategy to help increase the efficiency or the, uh, the productivity of your daylighting system. Uh, so looking at uh, daylight harvesting uh, in regards to CBEX 2012, uh, it's not very popular. Uh, most of our buildings um, are not designed um, to utilize daylighting as a um, primary lighting um, feature or system. Uh, you also, uh, the rate of return is a high variable. Um, so you typically only, you're gonna see it in large buildings, uh, which is what you can see here, 2% um, of all lit buildings versus 9% for uh, buildings over 50,000 square feet. Uh, for those of you who are interested, uh, the next CBUX uh, study, uh, 2018, has concluded. Uh, they've released primary uh, estimates, and they're planning on releasing uh, releasing additional uh, data in the spring and summer of 2021. So it hasn't been released yet, so it's looking more like a summer release. Uh, the reason why I say it's a high variable uh, is because uh, there's just a lot of factors that go into daylighting design, um, as well as the control systems. You can kind of think of a daylighting, our lighting design is kind of considered to be like painting, where it's done in layers on top of each other. Uh, and each one has a, a subsequent effect on the uh, overall space. Uh, the same is true with the control strategies that you implement. Uh, you should do be uh, doing an layered approach and you should be studying the gains uh, and well as subtractions that you're gonna get from uh, implementing those control strategies. Uh, this diagram here is from uh, Lutron. Uh, I like Lutron as a manufacturer just because uh, of the material they produce. Uh, it's very straightforward and uh, to the point. Um, and you'll see here that um, all these control strategies in regards to lighting, not just daylight harvesting, uh, all come with a range. Uh, the reason for that is uh, it's because we're dealing with uh, quite a bit of variables from occupancy, uh, scheduling, uh, space type usage, as well as weather data. So daylight harvesting, uh, what you need, uh, you need a couple things for it. Uh, you need a switch, a sensor, a ballast, a driver, and a fixture. Uh, fixture, sorry. <laughs> uh, it's gonna look something like uh, on the left um, where you have daylight entering a space, you have a photo control sensor, reading the illumination levels, um, taking into account the electric lighting in addition to the daylighting. Uh, that then sends that data to a controller, which has a predetermined um, matrix slash algorithm for determining um, what those results mean to it, uh, which will then you know send a signal to dim the light fixtures to appropriately so that um, it then starts to read the output um, within an acceptable um, threshold that it was programmed to. Uh, so what that looks like is, uh, so if we do this, someone enters a room, they start, they trigger, their presence is detected. Uh, it's constantly triggered by movement, so the lights are on. It's just assuming there's an occupancy, because typically occupancy and daylight harvesting go hand-to-hand -to -hand together. Uh, but then there's uh, adequate daylight in the space later on in the day, so we reduce the overall electrical output to 80% in the room. And it gets a little bit brighter, so we increase that, we increase that. And eventually there's there's the last moment triggered. And so we're, what we're trying to do is capture this green area. This is the savings you get for reducing uh, your overall kilowatt hours in response to available um, daylight illumination. Ooh, please click, sorry. 
uh, as well as uh, occupancy, um, turning off the lights or at least dimming them to um, a lower threshold um, until we're absolutely sure there's no one left in the space. So this is uh, what uh, the energy savings or what is constituted as a renewable energy for daylighting. With that said, uh, not everyone sees it that way. Uh, so LEED, uh, this is B4. Um, I'm making a different lecture um, this year um, going over um, 4.1 and the differences between it. Um, so stay tuned for that and sign up, please, if you're interested. Uh, but LEED considers uh, daylight across the entirety of the space on an analysis grid point by point, and it actually cares how well that space is performing in regards to daylight. Uh, code, on the other hand, for example, IECC 2015, uh, does not care about the quality of, of the space or the light. Uh, it goes off more rigid factors. Um, so spaces with a, generally what's required for daylight, um, having a daylight zone, um, is spaces with a total more than 150 watts of general lighting uh, with silent daylight zones complying within the silent daylight zone. Uh, so here's what that looks like visually. Uh, so on the left, this is kind of how uh, we would break down a space if we're trying to identify um, the quality of illumination within the space in regards to daylighting and electric lighting. Uh, we'll break it into the primary zone, the secondary, and the tertiary zone, the third primary zone. Um, and so LEED cares about all three of these zones. It cares about the entire space on how it's performing. So if you only have adequate daylight in your primary zone, chances are your space is not going to be graded very well. However, in regards to IECC, it's only going to recognize generally the primary zone. Uh, for this, uh, you're taking two feet on either side of a uh, window opening. Uh, this is a side lit example. Uh, your windows do have to have a certain amount of um, area. Uh, and then you take from this from the floor to the top seal of the window into the space. That's what your H is. And so that's going to define your daylight zone. Uh, it doesn't matter if you can prove that there is daylight happening right here in the space versus not here. Uh, it's only going to recognize that area and just that area. So that's, that's the big difference between the two. Um, but where are we going with the, in regards to code identifying uh, daylight? Uh, so this is IEC 2012. Uh, it's very broad, very open to interpretation and allows a lot of exceptions. Um, whereas if we jump to the changes for 2015, uh, we can see a lot changed. Uh, green was addition, red was subtraction, and white is what stayed the same. So we're definitely uh, still figuring this out and the best way uh, to kind of incentivize um, buildings to include daylight harvesting within um, their control strategies. So here's kind of what that looks like um, as far as the, the three zones that they, they typically identify um, as for daylight. Uh, you have the silent zone, which again is you know, spaces with total more than 150 watts of general lighting within the, the silent daylight zone. Uh, and so here's what that looks like. Uh, the next one is a uh, top lit daylight zone, which is a fancy way of saying a uh, rooftop monitor. Uh, again, it, it uh, has the same requirements of 150 watts of general lighting within a top lit daylight zone are required to have um, daylight harvesting. Uh, so here's how you would calculate that. Uh, this involves the ceiling height as well, uh, because obstructions greater than 0.7 of the ceiling height are excluded. So basically this right here, this area, you are not getting credit for. Uh, top lit daylight zone is basically the same thing, but it's uh, specifically made for skylights or atriums. Uh, it applies the same ceiling height um, restriction uh, and this is calculated the, the same way. So general lighting does not include lighting that is required to have specific application controls in accordance with specific application controls. Automatic daylighting controls shall be capable of automatically reducing the lighting power in response to available daylight by either one of the following methods. Uh, in 2018, this kind of got away. Um, you, you basically, you have to do continuous um, step dimming 
isn't really a feature anymore. Uh, so here's kind of what that looks like uh, as far as the additions and subtractions again. Um, the main thing to note, not much has changed uh, except for uh, applying for exemptions within a space. Uh, the biggest one being that uh, uh, new buildings where the total connected lighting power calculated in accordance with um, they provided an equation uh, is not greater than the adjusted interior lighting power um, allowance calculation in accordance with the equation. Um, so what that means is basically if your LPD is small enough, you don't have to provide um, daylight harvesting or photo controls within that, that space, even though uh, that it's considered general lighting, you know, greater than 150 watts. Uh, and that's mostly in response to um, LEDs. Uh, in regards to LEDs, because uh, the problem with, uh, I, I love LEDs, they're great, they're awesome, uh, great lighting technology. Uh, however, they make it really hard to sell uh, daylight harvesting as a viable um, control strategy, uh, just because of the cost benefit analysis. Uh, if you're using LEDs versus uh, compact fluorescence, the overall kilowatt hours available to save is less. So if you're saving 50% through daylight harvesting, but your kilowatt hours is say 100 with compact fluorescence versus 50 with LEDs, you're gonna save more money implementing this control strategy uh, with compact fluorescence than you would with LEDs. So that is, that is one challenge. Uh, so here's an example of comparing um, LEED versus uh, IECC. Uh, this is the GEM building. Uh, it's a project, uh, it's about 24,000 square feet, 1970s uh, federal style office building. Uh, it's converted into working artist studios uh, with shared amenities. There's a couple galleries as well as a, um, a theater in the basement. Um, so we worked on this. Uh, uh, we collected utility data, um, ASBA drawings, to site visits. Uh, we did some energy modeling on it as well as looking at the electric and daylighting model. Uh, so here's a floor plan of the first floor. Uh, so the red areas um, that are outlined here, this is what qualifies as a daylight zone according to IECC uh, 20, 2015. And the blue area is, this would be the, the secondary zone that you could potentially get credit for. Uh, and so the green area, this is what LEED would consider. All of it, 100% of the space. So even though so this, this space, this area over here in the space is, is dragging down the performance of this space because they only have side lighting. Um, even though it's, you know, a floor to ceiling uh, side lighting, it's still not going to effectively daylight the entire space. Uh, I had to explain to the architects, the difference is because they were applying for LEED, but they were also applying for incentive credits that the two areas were calculated differently and they're treated differently. Uh, does anyone have any questions on that um, so far? Uh, feel free to just unmute yourself or um, type it in the chat. No? Okay. Um, so a lot of what I get asked uh, in regards to daylighting for projects um, is how do you know when to daylight, if you should be investing in it at all. Uh, and so what I do is I perform a, a cost benefit analysis. Uh, there are several levels of the cost benefit analysis you can perform, but doing the first one, which is just the initial assessment, uh, is, also, is very good at determining whether you should be looking at the other two or not. Uh, so the five things you need to do that uh, would be your location, some weather data, uh, you know, different orientations on how you're planning on orienting the building, uh, window to wall ratios and glazing. I know the last two um, kind of seem uh, pretty detailed if you wouldn't know that until further on in the design process, but uh, given the kind of, I don't wanna say restrictions, but uh, rigorous requirements for uh, energy codes now, uh, you're typically gonna be limited on what your window to wall, window to wall ratio um, the range of it is, as well as the glazing. Um, so you can talk with uh, your engineer or your engineering firm you're working with 
um, and ask them what they feel is an appropriate range to start considering, because uh, they are going to know a rule of thumb uh, for what they want to see in regards to an early energy model. Uh, so breaking that down further, your location, uh, your latitude, lat uh, latitude and longitude, um, where you're at, as well as the hemisphere, uh, that's going to inform uh, kind of the available daylight, the, the gist of it. Um, to get a little further in, in detail, we're gonna, you want to look at your weather data. Uh, you want to look at clear versus cloudy days, um, as well as the amount of daylight that's typically available uh, in, that, in that city or that um, climate region. Uh, you want to look at orientation, uh, space programming, um, so how you're orienting uh, your space. Uh, I have projects that have wanted to do daylighting as a, um, as a primary lighting strategy. However, building orientation or spatial programming kind of uh, inhibited that, i.e. you have a firehouse bay that is 60% of the project floor area, and it has little to no window, no glazing, and it's on the north side that project as much as you want is not gonna make you know standards um, for meeting daylighting in regards to lead or getting your um, the full rate of return uh, as well on, on your investment. Uh, window to wall uh, ratio, you wanna consider uh, a range um, you know, that you're gonna operate in, whether you know, that being 30% to all the way up to 60%, depending on where your project is. Um, glazing. Uh, same thing, you just want to start with a range on your visual light transmission. Um, you know, so is if you're starting range is, is you know, below 40% um, that you're, you're considering for a project, you probably don't want to be doing daylighting as a main, as a main strategy. Um, so in addition to that, there are uh, incentives from various utility companies. Uh, I'm most familiar with the Idaho Power Incentives. Uh, it's the L3 one, uh, daylight photo controls. So lighting systems designed to operate within daylight photo controls can earn uh, up to 25 cents uh, per square foot of daylight space. Uh, so what is a daylight space according to Idaho Power? Uh, they refer to code. So uh, IEC, uh, what's defined as a daylight zone, that is what you're gonna get credit for. Uh, again, it doesn't matter if you went for lead certification and you designed a space to be um, at least, you know, 70% of it is going to be daylit, which is, you know, really helping out your score, getting you some credits for that. However, you're only going to get credit for what IEC identifies as a daylight zone. So looking at uh, the cost benefit analysis um, later on, you want to look at uh, lighting fixtures, the installation of labor, as well as commissioning of those fixtures, and then also installing the actual photo control sensors um, as well as uh, commissioning and setting them up and make sure they're, they're uh, working appropriately. Uh, this is changing in the lighting industry with uh, new technology, uh, the most relevant being uh, luminaire level lighting controls. Uh, that is where basically everything is installed in the fixture um, during the manufacturing process. Um, so photo control, occupancy sensor, wireless relay, Wi-Fi, um, whatever other sensors, temperature, um, air quality, et cetera, you can put those into the light. Uh, in addition, there are there are ways to add on after uh, manufacturing. Uh, but so that the main point of that one is um, to increase the overall efficiency uh, and integration of control systems, as well as reducing, you know, installation, commissioning, and labor and all that. Um, so on the right side, we have our rate of return. Uh, so always, always consider incentives. They're going to... Is there, a, is there a comment? Oh, yeah, sorry, I should add. Thank you, Shuri. Uh, the incentive is only available to um, spaces that are not required by code. Um, sorry to add that. I forgot to add that caveat. Um, so you're incentivized to go above and beyond code, what's not required. Uh, but you should always be looking for incentives. I'm presenting those in your cost analysis budget to your client uh, and showing them that they're going to get some help with it. Uh, the other big rate of return is the reduction of kilowatt hours. Um, so again, that's that's a very high variable. It's day by day. Um, like I said, daylight is not always available to meet demand. Um, so the amount um, of kilowatt hours that you can reduce in a day is just, it varies throughout the year. Uh, in addition, what I mentioned earlier, 
Uh, LEDs, while they're great, uh, they reduce the available kilowatt hours for savings. So getting into some lessons, um, here are the, some of the big ones. Uh, vegetation takes time to mature. Uh, external shading uh, should be opaque. Ensure blinds are easy to access and to use. Uh, typically, <laughs> I found in a project uh, or in, in spaces, occupants will either you know leave the blinds closed and just you know let your light even know it's a beautiful day outside. There's light that could potentially be coming in. They just don't open the blinds. <laughs> Uh, there are some designs you can do. Uh, we'll talk about refining the window uh, to avoid um, the use of blinds as a control strategy. Uh, please avoid saturated colors. Use high white. Uh, use low partitions in regards to furniture. Um, that gets into the three zones of daylight I talked about earlier, the primary, the secondary, and the third. Uh, the secondary is really uh, kind of what affects, is affected by uh, interior design in regards to how furniture is arranged and the height of that furniture. Uh, you also definitely please avoid direct solar gain in spaces. Uh, so we're going to go through each one of those uh, vegetation first. Uh, so this project uh, wanted to use trees uh, as a way to help uh, mitigate solar uh, heat gain during the summer and allow uh, some some uh, heat gain in the winter. However, uh, vegetation takes time to mature. Um, so just keep that in mind. Uh, talk to your landscape architect, work out a plan. Um, in addition here, you see they installed some interior roller shades and then occupants took it a, a step further to avoid some serious uh, glare uh, occurring. So just uh, keep that in mind. <laughs> uh, but vegetation is probably one of the more better um, investments in regards to a control strategy for uh, daylighting, uh, just because it adds to the site uh, and the building and the context. Uh, but typically you want to try to um, use uh, trees that will, or vegetation that will shade in the summer, but allow uh, heat gain in the winter. Uh, so that's going to help you with your cooling and heating loads, as well as uh, reducing um, energy use. Uh, there's also different types of vegetation uh, for different types of, of the sun, uh, for, for um, sunlight when it's exposed. Uh, these typically I, I see as a less uh, return on investment uh, because they're only, um, they're only being used for a small instance in the day, um, whereas overall, uh, except for the probably the early morning one, um, that one is also good for mitigating uh, glare from adjacent um, storefronts or uh, on street or um, parking in parking lots. Uh, so shading is, is very important, making sure you get the correct overhang and the angle of incidence for uh, the seasons that you're trying to prevent. Um, so here's an interesting one in, um, sorry, this is uh, a uh, student housing uh, dorms in uh, Portland. Uh, and so you'll notice that these over these overhangs are a little bit unique uh, in that this one over here, a vertical overhang, uh, has a slight angle cut into it. And then in addition, you can see that um, part of it is solid while the rest of it is perforated. And you can see that the perforations uh, change uh, about halfway. So the reason for that, that is, is they're trying to allow um, this filtering of, of daylight into the space. Um, however, something to keep in mind is if you use a solid uh, material, uh, part of it's going to act like a light shelf. Um, so the problem I have with this placement here is that as there's going to be certain times of the day where light's going to refract and it's going to block it, which is what it's intending to do. But in addition, it's going to refract light into this space, which could recreate glare up here. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind. Uh, in addition, so the reason why um, they cut this, so the reason why you have vertical fins um, as a control strategy is for when the sun is transitioning. Um, so rising versus setting, uh, or if your building is at an angle, not on true um, cardinal orientation. Uh, this will help block that, that hard line of sight um, that you get for the sun. Uh, this one, they're doing the opposite where they decided they didn't want to block all of it, uh, which could be good. Uh, that's what their intended use was, but that, that's why you, you, you see that. Um, so please consider 
uh, how the angle of incident um, will occur in your design. Um, so if you have a flat finished surface, you're going to be able to predict that angle of incident um, more readily. Whereas if you have something that's uh, speculated, um, it's cut through rough, you know, not treated as well. Um, so it's specular versus diffuse reflection. Uh, and please, for just don't, don't do this, this example right here. Uh, it's just, it's really bad. <laughs> this is the Concordia or it was the Concordia Law School um, that is downtown. Um, basically, so as you can see, you just look at the, the shadows here, you can see it's it's basically not doing anything. It's just decorative. Uh, so you, you typically don't wanna do anything round. Uh, anything round is kind of, not that you're not allowed to, but you're kind of letting it go and foregoing control, uh, in my opinion. Uh, blind access, uh, again, is very important. Blinds will definitely affect how a space can perform uh, and whether or not your control strategy that you, you spent time and implemented and invested in is going to be used. Uh, so if you look at this uh, set of images, on the left, we have the blinds down, rotated open. Very good. We have a uh, you know, nice grinding, climbing illumination. Uh, there's some peak here. Um, this has to do with the, the office furniture and the electric lights. Uh, versus if we have the blinds closed at 66%. You see, we're getting a similar curve, but there's less overall illumination. Uh, blinds closed, light at 100%. You can see we got a really strong peak. So there's that while there's, there's illumination here, uh, it's by no means uh, uniform uh, what we're looking for. Whereas if we have blinds up and no lights, you can see we have, you know, far this this uh, kind of flattens out the curve, gives us uh, more of an even illumination that that we're looking for in the space. Uh, so, make, if you are going to use blinds, especially if you know they're going to be high clear story windows or blinds, please make sure they are accessible, um, so that occupants will use them to change um, how the space operates as intended. Uh, so what about avoiding blinds completely? Uh, this is in Idaho Falls. It's the Center for Advanced Energy Studies. Uh, so if you notice here on this facade, we have the overhangs uh, brought down about three quarters of the way up of, of the window. And so what that's doing, and we have an interior light shelf here, what that's doing is that's basically separating the window to be a view window versus a daylight window. And we have an open exposed uh, ceiling area here with a inclined uh, ceiling plane here. And so what that's doing is that's just uh, creating the, the necessary conditions for enough ambient bounces that we don't get direct sun, but we're still getting uh, illumination from, from our lighting sources. And so that's kind of the intention and the goal of, of daylight illumination. Uh, avoiding saturated colors. Uh, this is a school. Uh, a charter school uh, by McKibber, McKibben and Cooper Architects. Uh, here they're using high white. Um, so color affects um, the mood. So sometimes you may want to change that, uh, but most of the time you're gonna, gonna go, we'll go with a flat high white. Um, that's just going to increase your overall um, uh, ambient bounces and overall effectiveness of your daylighting. And from up there, uh, we, we really want a strong, even illumination. So we want as much as possible out of that. Uh, the other reason I should like to show this project is the overhang. You'll notice here, the overhang uh, extends well past uh, the window plane. Uh, so the reason for that is, is if we come back here at the, the appropriate time, you're gonna see this angle shift all the way to about right here at a certain time of day. And so what that's doing is that's blocking um, the sun throughout the entirety of the day. They didn't want any direct solar gain happening um, from this point up. Uh, and so that's the opposite approach of what I showed you um, at the, the housing in Portland. Uh, so it really depends and it doesn't really, it doesn't, uh, some people kind of look at this and they're like, why did they do that? Uh, it looks weird. It seems like they, you know, they made a mistake. Um, they didn't. Uh, in regards to that, they just made a calculation uh, for how the sun would behave. However, I will note, uh, if you look here, you can see that uh, the interior where 
there's a recessed for where the actual win window and mullions are. There is a little bit of daylight sneaking through um, that wasn't probably intended. Uh, so keep that in mind. Uh, we're going to shift gears now. Uh, if anyone has any questions, uh, please let me know. Uh, I want to show you a tool on our website. There we go. Uh, so you go to our website, idlboise.com, and you go to services, design tools. Uh, this page is uh, still being developed. I'm working on it. Um, but the first uh, six are available. We're transferring over um, a few of our other ones from other websites that we had. Uh, but the one we're interested in today is the daylight pattern guide. So you go ahead and click that. It's going to take you to a new page and it tells you a bit about it, um, how it was created. Um, but if you click launch, it's going to open a new tab or a new browser, depending on what you're using. Uh, I recommend using Chrome. Uh, so if you, this is the daylight pattern guide uh, developed with the New Building Institute, uh, as well as our sister lab over at Wazoo. Uh, so if you can look at the patterns here, uh, we have, I think there's 20, or 19, 19 patterns. Uh, but this will kind of go through. Uh, this is this is a tool intended to help designers, but more and more what I find it's being used for and what I like to use it for is for clients uh, and demonstrating visual visually the changes and the impact certain things can have. Um, so one of those I think is really well is the section depth. Um, so this is going to show you just the performance. So it's a slideshow. And so it'll show you the changes that happen and the actual performance um, that's being, um, that's occurring. See, so 50%. So this goes into building width. Uh, so not making your buildings um, too wide uh, because daylight is limited in what it can actually um, reach into the space. And once you go past a certain width, so you see 80%, and then we have a huge drop off to 50%. So that's when that's when you're going to want an additional um, daylighting strategy, either you know um, from the top as uh, skylight, solar tubes, uh, rooftop monitors, etc., or you're just going to want to change how your programming works so that you have additional side lighting um, elsewhere in the building. Uh, but there are a lot of patterns uh, dealing with workstations, courtyards, blinds, shades, top lighting, atriums. Uh, window area, uh, floor plate geometry, etc. Uh, so I encourage you to go through um, and look at this. Uh, it's very helpful uh, for just understanding or conveying concepts as well as you know just demonstrating to a client uh, potentially why you made a certain decision and the impact it's it's having on the project. Okay. Uh, any questions on that or how to use that tool? Nope. Okay. Um, so it has to be said, unfortunately, but uh, avoid direct sun in spaces. Um, it has unintended consequences. Um, some people do like it. I've met people that love having the sun on their face while they work. I don't understand it, <laughs> uh, but I'm, I'm not one of those people. Um, so just looking at the, the details, doing a, a solar study um, would really help you um, understand how the, the sun is going to affect um, your building as well as the programming within the building. Uh, so for example, this here, this is a really nice mural. Uh, you wouldn't know it though, because they had to cover it up because you're getting uh, sun into this space, which re refracted off of that. And you know, it's some air in these instances is perfect at work level height. Um, so it's pretty uncomfortable to work with that. Uh, so this could have been avoided by Simply just, you know, some math uh, as well as our computer simulation model of just playing with uh, the spacing as well as the angle of these uh, of these fins. Sure, yeah, there we go. Um, so avoiding missteps. I uh, talked earlier about the site context and form as well as, you know, cost benefit analysis for weather data. Uh, so, in my opinion, it's important to understand your site as it will provide you with data that can impact your building's performance and design. Context around the site will inform you of your previous design strategies of, sorry, not of yours, of previous design strategies or practices such as orientation or width. 
Uh, please note though that the form of your building should take advantage of the sun path as relative to the latitude and longitude. However, other site conditions such as circulation, wind, or obstruction should not be disregarded. So this is where the, uh, the cost benefit analysis uh, comes into play. Uh, in that if, you know, if, if it's not a viable um, uh, strategy of lighting or control strategy for daily harvesting, uh, it shouldn't be driving all of your decisions. So I'm gonna show you that web website I talked about. Uh, I love this website, uh, it's really great. Please support them if you do end up using it. It's uh, free to use. Um, so we're gonna look at um, Boise, Idaho. That's where we are. Uh, so if you type that into weatherspark.com, uh, you're gonna get a bunch of ads because I'm not logged in right now with my ad blocker. <laughs> uh, but uh, you're gonna get an overall climate uh, if you scroll down, you know, give me some temperature, precipitation, et cetera. But what we're interested in is the other weather data uh, for cloud cover. So we can see when it is completely clear versus overcast. So you see it's uh, kind of in our favor, you know, 40% uh, of the time it's kind of the average uh, clear, not the best, but it's, it's okay. Uh, if we scroll down, uh, there's gonna be this section called sun. Very helpful if you want to look into uh, your site's um, amount of daylight that's available. Uh, so this gives you the hours of uh, available daylight throughout the year, uh, as well as how twilight uh, and sunset um, are affecting. Uh, and cool thing I really like about this is you can click on this and it's going to take you into um, a more detailed view um, looking at that information. And so you can look at See, now we're looking at the months instead of just the entire year. And if we want, we can go even further. We can look at a specific day. Uh, the other thing I use this for is for helping clients uh, achieve lead credits um, because the way lead works is you can choose specific in the additional options, not the first one, but the second and the third one. Uh, it asks you to pick days um, based off of the, the spring and fall equinox and then additional days throughout the year. Um, so using this will uh, help you determine when's the best day for you to run your simulation so that you're going to get uh, you're going to have the most daylight performance um, so you have a better chance of meeting uh, thresholds okay um, oops, sorry there we go um some path diagram i know most of you if not all of you recognize this image i know you don't like drawing it um but it is still one of the best ways of analyzing the sun uh, for a particular site. Uh, you'll find this in your sun, wind, and light um, architectural design strategies. Um, however, if you don't want to do the old school, that's fine. Uh, you can thank someone at the University of Oregon for doing his thesis on how to create a digital version of that. Um, so again, if you use this, this program, um, they accept uh, no liability for it. Um, so the data you get from it, it's, you know, your responsibility to double check it and make sure that it's good data. Uh, but basically you can get a digital version of, of that um, sun diagram for, for your site. Um, so this one is for Boise, um, you know, 43 versus negative 116 uh, latitude and longitude. And then, so this will tell, this tells us a lot of data about how the sun's uh, going to perform uh, and how we need to uh, designer building to mitigate uh, potential impact from it. Uh, but visually, 3D, you can also look at that now. Um, so here's kind of what that looks like. So if we look at this line, June 21st, right here, okay? So if we wanted to plot that in three dimensions, basically this is what it would look like. You have your, your compass and then here's the path it's gonna follow. And the time it's, it's gonna be there at the intervals. Uh, this is in Revit. Um, this solar study, uh, for lack of better terms, can be considered now a poor man's solar study. Uh, since the induction of uh, InSight, Revit has the, the photovoltaic, um, that's kind of their solar study analysis now. And you can use that to give you actual data on how the sun will affect your building's performance. Uh, this is more of uh, just determining um, when and where so like uh, in this example here, um, 10 a.m. versus 4 p.m. tracking the sun's position movement. I don't know 
the intensity or the values of illumination here, but I know that there is going to be there, uh, that it's going to be there at around 4 p.m. And I know that because this floor is polished concrete, I'm going to have to tell them they're going to have to implement you know, curtains, some more vegetation, or some kind of control strategy for this gallery space. Uh, and then this slide I skipped over real quick. Uh, this is just in the settings. Uh, always, always set your location first. Make sure you are in the cor correct location. Always check ground plane at level. Um, I like to just label the, the ground floor as the ground floor in my models uh, so I don't get confused. Uh, and then you're choosing, you know, whether you want to do a single day, multiple day, um, throughout one day, um, whether you want to fall on the equinoxes or the solstices, uh, those options are available for you. Uh, so now we're going to get into refining the window. So the window, uh, we like to think of it in three parts here at the lab. Uh, you have the interior, the envelope, and the exterior. Uh, the interior uh, control strategies being light shelves, lure blinds, roller shades, or uh, mullion details. Uh, the envelope, we consider the daylight versus the view window. So the daylight window is this top portion here. That's uh, kind of segregated by the louver or interior light shelf. Uh, and then this becomes the view window. Uh, we also like to look at uh, visual light transmission versus solar heat gain coefficients. Uh, the exterior, uh, contextual shading, building self-shading, is there an overhead, overhang, uh, or uh, landscaping? So here's visually what that looks like, um, what we mean by um, daylight versus view window. So if an occupant were to close the blinds on here, we're essentially losing all of our performance for our daylight harvesting system. Whereas if we break the window up into two different uh, control strategies, uh, we can have the occupant be comfortable at their desk working while also maintaining daylight illumination in the space, allowing our system to function. So the daylight window's primary function is to provide the maximum of daylight deep into the space from the perimeter. Typically, the daylight provided to the interior will be approximately two times the head height of the window. Uh, we recommend using high performance glass in the window uh, to provide high visibility, um, i.e. 70% uh, upwards, um, while also, you know, not ignoring the solar heat gain coefficient, um, you want it to at least be 35%. Uh, the view window's primary function is to provide a comfortable view um, for the, uh, the building's occupants. Uh, gives the occupants um, of the space the ability to relax their eye muscles by allowing deep visual focus. It also gives people a connection to the outdoor environment. Uh, the glazing in the view window is often tinted to about 50% visual light transmission. This reduces the contrast ratio between the interior surfaces and the spaces. Uh, so you really want to kind of be delicate with this because uh, you don't want to have those contrast issues, especially in like uh, what this picture is uh, um, showing is a school, because uh, you definitely want people to be able to focus or do uh, what they intended to in, in the space. Uh, an exterior overhang that is about as deep as the window, um, it is shading um, is high, is one to one ratio. Um, that's for the south. Uh, so typically, so basically if we put this on a joint, uh, we could roll and, you know, if it was movable, we could basically close this off and cover the window entirely. Um, that's kind of the, let me stop clicking on that, uh, the ratio. Uh, this will reduce solar gain throughout um, the glazing significantly during times of the year. Uh, however, as I mentioned earlier, uh, so you can see this is flush with the exterior um, perimeter wall, but the recessed uh, doesn't have anything in there. And so this is what you get is uh, we're losing daylight um, through the daylight window that we could potentially be reflecting into the space. So we're hurting our performance there, um, as well as we have daylight coming down here, uh, hitting the mullions where they weren't intended um, to be, um, so that could create um, glare or contrast issues on uh, just this, uh, the transition between the two windows. Um, so that's something to keep in mind is how your overhangs um, attach. Um, I recommend trying to get them uh, uh, as well to the mullion as well, so there's no gap. Uh, next is interior light shelf. Interior light shelf provides three major benefits to the space, uh, blocks direct sun, reduces light levels at the perimeter, 
and reflects uh, diffuse lights on uh, diffuse light onto the ceiling plane. Uh, the daylight window is not shaded from the exterior. Uh, it is crucial that the glass have properties to allow low solar heat gain coefficient because this is where if we want as much daylight coming through um, that window as possible without affecting um, the glare, uh, glare or contrast performance of the space. Uh, louver blinds um, are a great um, way of controlling or uh, mitigating the daylight window um, for whether uh, the space needs to be dimmed or not, um, as well as you know, mitigating glare. So if you wanna, if there's glare happening for whatever reason during a time of day, um, louvers can be a great way to allow light still into the space while mitigating glare. Um, so an example of that would be right here. So you can see there's glare refracting uh, on the floor here, but where there, the louver has been lowered, uh, it's reducing that. Uh, so having that on either the daylighting or the view window um, can be uh, very, very useful um, as a control strategy. Uh, so here's kind of uh, shading by orientation. Uh, so the south facade, uh, you should just have a horizontal overhang. Uh, there's no need for a vertical fin. Uh, in some cases, uh, having an interior light shelf can be helpful. Uh, for east and west, uh, you can have a fin in some cases, uh, mostly depends on your building's orientation. And that's kind of to mitigate the setting sun and the rising sun as it transitions. Um, overhangs are also applicable uh, as well as our interior light shelves. Uh, on the north side of the facade, please never put a horizontal overhang. Um, it's, it's, it's not going to do anything but hurt your, your building's performance in regard to lighting, um, as well as probably um, just the overall um, space lighting in the north side of the building. Uh, fins in some cases, because uh, depending on the building's orientations, if it's off axis, that might be necessary. But for the most part, the north facade is getting um, refracted light already. That's, that's how it's getting it most with light source. So you don't need to uh, ref, you know, um, continue refracting is going to decrease the quality of, of the light and provide less overall illumination. Uh, so one ratio that kind of, my opinion, is not well, well known is the light to solar heat gain ratio. It's not really a standardized rule of thumb, but it basically uh, describes the relationship between visible light and solar heat gain. So what that looks like is uh, different control strategies are more effective or less effective at mitigating that than others. Uh, so for example, having uh, reflective blinds, um, they're pretty good at uh, reducing the overall solar heat gain. Uh, as I mentioned about louvers earlier, they can you know, mitigate glare while allowing uh, daylight um, to still illuminate the space. However, they're far less efficient at mitigating solar heat gain. Uh, so here's kind of what that looks like. Uh, visual light uh, is expressed as, sorry, visual light transmission is expressed as a percentage, whereas visual light is expressed as a number from zero to one. They literally mean the exact same thing. Um, the only difference is, is for plugging it into equations. Uh, but on the right, this image shows you uh, kind of what the journey of light um, is going through. You have your uh, initial incident, uh, then some of it is refracted. Some of it is absorbed into the first pane, uh, continues through. Uh, some of it is absorbed into the second pane, uh, then it's transmitted. And then because of the laws of thermodynamics, hot to cold, uh, a lot of this heat is re-radiated into the interior space. Uh, so uh, I mentioned earlier uh, about working within ranges and kind of establishing those ranges. Uh, if you do need a jumping off point, uh, for starting your simulations or just, you know, trying to figure out what your visual light transmission should be uh, for Boise, uh, this is what we recommend. Uh, for the south, we recommend a VLT of 66, a solar heat gain coefficient of 0.27. Um, operating, um, so, sorry, <laughs> I always read this wrong. Uh, the visual light transmission between 0.45 to 0.66 and a solar heat gain coefficient between 0.28 and 0.27. Uh, and so the east and west are pretty similar to the south. 
Uh, he starts to see some changes on the north. Uh, we want a higher visual light transmission on the north. Um, like I said, the, all the, most of the light the north facade will receive has already been refracted. Um, so trying to allow as much as possible into there, um, into those spaces is uh, what we recommend. Uh, any questions on these? Uh, so control direct sun and provide even diffused daylight from the perimeter on the south and potentially the, the west or east elevation. Uh, it's kind of how we like to view the envelope. So putting it all together. Uh, so here's an example. Um, I showed a little bit of the interior earlier, but here's uh, the exterior. Uh, so we have those uh, exterior louvers. You can see there's a small gap here uh, between the, the louver and the mullions, but it's uh, not, it's uh, negligible. Uh, we also have operable windows for natural ventilation, um, but you see we've separated uh, the daylight uh, from the view window, um, as well as we have extended the, the overhangs are going past um, the frame of the, of the window to provide uh, shading adequately. Uh, and th this is right here. Uh, I don't know if you can see it all that well, but you can see there's a small line of daylight coming through. Uh, so this is what I'm talking about when I say it's a high variable um, rate of return or control strategy where there, there's just a lot of variables. Is that just on this particular day at this time, everything kind of lined up to allow the sun to be at this angle to almost um, have some direct solar gain where we, we didn't want, we where we didn't intend it to. Um, so that's what I mean is there's just a lot of variables and factors that go into it. So there are days where your control strategy, your exterior louvers or your interior light shelves um, or your blinds, et cetera, are going to hurt your daylighting uh, performance rather than help it. And there are going to be the, the trick is to get the majority of those days to be um, where it's helping or mitigating um, the performance in a way that you want. But there are going to be there are a handful of days throughout the year where you're not going to be able to control that. Uh, and so here's what that looks like um, on the interior. Uh, just, you know, implementing, uh, you can see the, we have louvers here for the view windows, uh, but we have actual uh, blinds here on the top for the daylight windows. And that's uh, mostly because this is a school. Uh, and so when they, when they get presentations, you know, they actually need to dim the room. Um, so that's, that's why you see that the uh, the two differences there. And so speaking of blinds, um, automated blinds, really cool. Um, not everyone loves them though. <laughs> uh, the reason why is because uh, the automated blinds are kind of like the uh, the tree vegetation, where it just takes time to implement them properly. Uh, so whereas a line of trees will take time to grow. Um, the automated um, exterior blinds need data collected to um, monitor their performance and how well they're performing and how adjustments should be made. Uh, and typically, the most complaint I get from uh, automated blinds is that they're really loud. Um, so another question uh, I get a lot about exterior shelves or interior light shelves, I'm sorry, uh, louvers um is how to know where to place it uh, like how tall should your daylight window be versus your view window how um much into the interior should your lights your your uh your light shelf extend versus you know uh, if you want to go outside the rule of thumb for the exterior louver um what should you do uh so here's a very basic equation this is just assuming the minimum uh number of variables uh and this should be a jumping off point uh, this should not be, you know, your finalized uh, design um, for determining your interior um, light shelf or your exterior louver height and positioning. Uh, this is kind of just to get you get you started. Uh, so we're interested in the uh, the height of the work plane, uh, the height of the window uh, versus ceiling. Uh, then it's also going to, you know, be some guesswork based off of what's actually being um, done in the space, as well as you know, interior arrangement of furniture, um, et cetera. Uh, so here's an example of that. Ooh, we are definitely at time. I'm so sorry, we got rambling. Uh, so here's an example of, of that. Um, 
uh, just doing that. As you can see, uh, this one I purposely set up um, so that it would be wrong. Um, so kind of show you, you do need to make adjustments to it. Uh, this would be a very poor um, daylight uh, daylight uh, window or view um, performance for harvesting. Uh, so I guess before we wrap up, uh, I'll, give, I'll leave you with a fun fact I like to include um, in my lectures. Um, this is on the right. This is one of the first light shelves um, ever, not, not created, but uh, commercially made, uh, manufactured and try to be sold. Um, it was a German company. Uh, it was done in 1868 at the World's Fair. Uh, and I guess I will summarize with, uh, the practice of lighting design has made a resurgence in recent decades where both daylight and electric light are considered for building and space types. In addition, uh, returning to an old practice, there have been significant efforts to modernize the practice of lighting design as a science, such as lighting levels, LPD values, and glare index. Uh, so I apologize for uh, going over time. I'm going to go ahead and start a poll. Uh, if you could fill that out, uh, we appreciate it. Uh, but I'll keep talking uh, until until everyone's done with the poll or, or left, I guess. Um, uh, if you have any questions, that would be a great time to uh, um, to ask them. I'll try to get to them. Uh, this slide, uh, I guess while you're filling out the poll, uh, is an example I like to show on just implementing, uh, or at least how layers can affect uh, lighting design. Uh, so A and B are, uh, are overcast uh, days. Uh, and so you can see, you know, there's adequate performance of, of lighting in, in A. And then if we add that exterior overhang to kind of create the view versus daylight window, uh, we can see that our performance is uh, uh, significantly uh, inhibited uh, because of that, it being an overcast day. So that's what I'm talking about when I say that not all the time is your design gonna be performing adequately. Um, C uh, through F are sunny, clear days. Uh, C being uh, adding that exterior louver. Uh, and then D being the same situation as C, except we treated the exterior louver to be highly reflective. So now we can see uh, it reflecting onto the ceiling, uh, potentially creating some glare issues. Uh, then E is the same way, except we did not add a skylight or a clear story to the back of the room. Uh, we tilted the exterior louver 15 degrees and it is now refracting back there. And then F is we've added the interior light shelf. We kept the uh, the tilt and reflect and reflective material on the exterior, and then we've added the interior light shelf uh, to be treated as well. So you can see how all these um, add up and affect the performance of the space. Uh, I guess lastly, uh, real quick, these are the variables um, you should be taking into consideration for light shelves. Uh, we talked a lot about the geometry and the reflectance type, uh, as well as material type. Um, some things we didn't cover uh, were position adjustments and rotations. Um, so being able to adjust or move a louver, uh, in my opinion, would be extremely helpful in mitigating those days where your control strategies are not performing adequately. Um, building data, so room dimensions, uh, including ceiling form or shape, I showed you one example of a recessed inclined ceiling uh, where it was open and then it then it went into a, a recessed um, ceiling plane. There's an example of that, uh, as well as just understanding your climate. Uh, it's probably the biggest one, um, whether or not you should be making that investment in the first place. Uh, okay, I think uh, we'll call it a day. I have some other weird examples of light shells I wanted to talk about, but um, we're a little bit over time, I apologize. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, please attend our, our next lecture. Uh, I believe we have the BSUG on the 28th, and I believe we have dedicated outdoor air systems on the 21st of April. Uh, so thank you all for coming.